Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, Greg, do you want to speak now? Hi, um, thanks for that, uh, Christiane. That, that was not just interesting, but quite moving. Um, I'd, I'd like you to address the issue of scale. Uh, the, the term cultural trauma and quotes like, for traumas at the level of collectivity, social crises must become cultural crises. How wide can a trauma extend? Um, you know, the, you can talk about notions of global culture, but the, the sharing of it is, is not as deep as uh, more delimited uh, units, um, national down to community and such. Um, so how, does, how, how do you theorize the, the way that cultural trauma interacts with the scale of a collectivity when there's not always a notion of a shared culture? Thanks. That's such a good question. I'm working on an answer to that. I was working on an answer to that all the way through dealing with systems theory. I mean, on the one hand, Murdoch University is full of phenomenologists who would be quite upset to hear me saying these kinds of things. Uh, I mean it almost heuristically. I mean it as in to say, a collective culture is not necessarily one comprised of individual units. So the collectivity is comprised of every single person on my street. Rather, it is something which we engage with when we engage with other people. You might not necessarily be thinking about the pandemic, but then when you speak to somebody and it's the first thing that you're confronted with and you turn on the telly and it's the first thing that you see, it's, it's, it's a matter of exposure. So I see it almost as a matter of, not of scale in terms of is it a thousand people or 10,000 people, but more a matter of ubiquity. Okay, thank you. Um, Guy, would you like to ask your question? Hi Chris, thanks for the talk. Um, thanks for the hosting of the talk too, to Dorinda. Um, I guess my question would go to around the responsibility for communicating things and the emphasis on not, uh, not making it morally hazardous or no, maladaptive adaptation causing uh, communication out there. I guess my question was, have you looked or into or thought much about the early reaction, which seemed to have that in mind with regards to face masks, in that there was a lot, a large early push for people not to go out and buy their own face masks because people claimed it wasn't going to protect them, but also they were really worried about it stripping out and well, making things sell out, preventing carers and such from being able to access them. So the media then left um, ahead okay. to try and counter a narrative. I have a class 10 to 12. Sorry. After that, someone's talking. Or before that would be Sorry, that's probably in my back. Right. Sorry. Um, and sorry to, I don't make, mean to monopolize with, with a double barrel question. I just, I'll leave it at that first information hazards and responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first part is, um, I think a lot of people will be feeling rather embarrassed about the whole mask thing, because this is what I was talking about with dare to use your own reason, as if masks don't work, you know, like as if masks do not work for at least keeping spit off somebody when you're speaking to them, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's very, very basic. So on the one hand, you had this attitude of better safe than sorry. On the other hand, you had like, well, the very basics of being safe denied, right? So I think when people realized that what was going on and they shifted from obviously masks don't work to, oh, no, no, obviously the government lied to us. There's an embarrassment that happens, which makes people less likely to comment because, you know, it's like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. People don't want to be coming across as a person who's repeatedly getting it wrong. So in answer to your question, I think responses to the mask were a good first salvo for people getting used to speaking about something just because an expert has said it. And this is what I'm talking about with the delegitimization that's happening to these carrier groups. They're saying things which are aimed at, uh, 
aims, they're saying things according to aims, which are not the aims that are being articulated to the community. So there is a disparity there. I don't know if that's answered your question, but I hope that it has. No, it does. But if I could sneak in another one, <laughs> um, I was wondering whether you've put any thought with regards to precarity in different situations, particularly with a view to down the line with climate change. If the seasons are precarious and if society is precarious because we don't know what natural disaster is happening or what supply chain is disrupted, does that have similar effects? Or how is that variant from COVID, et cetera, or neoliberalism? The first thing is the starting place has been uh, the employer needs flexibility because they need agility, because we live in such an unpredictable and disruptive world. The best way to have that is to have a flexible, i.e. limited term, casualized workforce. That was already going on. Now we're facing real disruption where you're having organizations close because they are losing so much money in a matter of a week. That is going to make that previous attitude, in my view, worse. Oh my God, we're living in a time of crisis. That was just the first one. We don't know what the future will be like. Why would we have more continuing staff, right? So that's the first part. The second part, I hate having to say this guy, is people are saying, um, what kind of world do we want to build coming out of this? Uh, anybody who has been in the precariat knows that it's deeply disempowering. You will nod your head and agree with things you would never dream of agreeing with if you think you can get a job out of it because being unemployed is awful, right? So I don't think that this is going to be met with people coming back courageously. I think it will have a chilling effect. People will be more dependent on employers and thus probably willing to put up with uh, more. So not a happy thing to say, but I think that's probably more realistic. Okay. Thank you, um, Christian. I think we can all give him a, um, a clap for his presentation and for his time and the thoughts that you've shared with us. Thank you for that. Um, we, we will be, um, oh, Jason's just raised his hand. So we will be leaving the meeting open. Maybe we can, if you really burst in to ask your question, I'm sure Christian will be hanging around for a little bit and you can ask your questions to him then. Um, so I do want to uh, close this meeting for, so people want to leave. Um, just next week, I need to announce that we have Katie Gressier. She'll be sharing her research on rare breed farming. Um, I do think we will be creating a new link every week. Is that correct, Dutari? So just keep an eye on your inbox for that. Um, I'll send that in your link. Yeah, so every, rather than using the recurring links, we will be sending out a, a new link just for um, security purposes. And I think that is all we have for today. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Feel I'm free to, to stay. stay. <laughs> yes. <I'm happy. laughs>